Good morning. Morning, everybody. Morning. How are we all doing? Okay. We're getting here, slowly but surely. <laughs> Charles, did you get a um, an email from me about that inaugural, inaugural painting? Uh, who am I talking to, or who's talking to me? Yeah. <laughs> Jeanette. Oh, um, when did you send oh. it? Oh, it's been about a week ago. The inaugural painting. Painting. No, I don't think I did. Well, do search your emails because I, I think, I don't know. Um, now is this is this the uh the the young young boy who painted Kamala Harris? No, no. This is the for the painter that um that um that uh they have for the inaugural painting that the first lady selected which was from one of the Hudson River painters. Oh, 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 yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah I, uh, Okay. It's a rainbow. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I remember you, that. I sent you an email mm -hmm. about it. That's right. What I asked. Yeah, and yeah. you were saying how how you know because you've heard about the Hudson River painters, you were glad to recognize. Yeah. Yeah, it was a very familiar. You know, the whole because we had spent quite a bit of time that day on those landscapes, and uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, it we was, did. Uh, it was good to know that. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're they're one of the many kind of pivotal groups yeah. that uh, are important to American art history. Right. Um, you know, because they, you know, they, they were fairly early on. Uh, and then they, you know, pretty much, I would say that was one of the earliest art movements uh, that really kind of broke away from the right. traditional European painting, what, whatever was known about it in this country at the time. Yeah. Uh, and, and we started to kind of create our own uh, American identity, you know, yeah. as American art, so. Well, the other thing too, you had mentioned that a lot of that was like idealized in terms of, you know, they, they, they mm -hmm. painted, you know, ideally what places look like too, you know, and I thought that was right. interesting, you know. Yeah, because, yeah, you don't, yeah, in this country, uh, I don't think we have any active volcanoes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> luckily, luckily, well, we, we do, we do actually in Hawaii, but not on the mainland. Um, okay. You know, but yeah, you don't usually find like active volcanoes and then, you know, big waterfalls, you know, like the ones that you find in Yellowstone and, and all like okay. right there together. Um so, so yeah, they, they were very, uh, they took a lot of artistic license and were very imaginative about yeah. their landscapes and things. That's, so. yeah. uh, that's what I like to do, just kind of make it, you know, what, what, the way I want it to be, you know. Well, and you know, that's interesting that you say that, Bernice, because we are going to <laughs> actually watch a film about that today. Okay. okay? Um, you know, it's, it's, it runs a little long, but it's, it's really fascinating, um, because it's this whole introduction to a lot of ideas about what art is and, um, you know, how, how the viewpoint of what art and artists, uh, particularly like in the late 20th century and, and now the 21st century, is really rapidly changing you know? um, and the place you know kind of the place of artists you know why are artists important in our culture and society 
you know, as we know. So, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of things said in this particular uh, film that, you know, I, you know, you, you look at it and go, huh, okay. Yeah. You know, that, you know, the, the people that we often think of as quote unquote professional artists out there, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's an interesting look into that. So at any rate, uh, we'll give everybody just a minute or two to get here. Uh, cause there's 10 of us right now. Uh, how's everybody doing? Good. Hi. Charles. Hey, so this, is, this is Bob. Yeah. I, I have a, I have a question about some airbrushing. Uh, it's probably best if I emailed you my question and probably answered it the other way rather than take up class time. No, let's do it now. That way everybody else benefits from, you know, find out a little bit about airbrushing. They, you may even inspire them to want to try it. Okay, basically what I'm looking at is spattering uh -huh. uh, on the on the canvas, and and uh, is it the paint is too thin, my pressure is too high, both or either? <laughs> uh, it could be both. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so so when you're saying spattering, you're talking about spattering that you don't want. It's not intense. Yes, correct. Okay. That's correct. Yes. Yeah, because you can also use an airbrush to kind of create a spatter. Right. It's kind of uniform that you want. But uh, usually what happens, um, you may be airbrushing too long or, or holding the nozzle down too long, you know, rather than short burst. And so what's okay. happening is the condensation of the paint is building up around the tip of the nozzle and then you're getting the spatter as well as okay. your spray. So okay. uh, usually, you know, when you're airbrushing, you know, don't, don't just keep going, you know, forever. <laughs> I know okay. it, it gets tempting to do that, but in yes. doing that, you know, like I said, you, you begin to build up uh, liquid in around the edge of that nozzle there and then it starts spinning. So. Because basically what I'm, what I'm doing right now is and prepping my canvases, I'm using the airbrush with acrylic mm -hmm. uh, to, to, you know, rather than just to brush it on, just for practice sake. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, and and I was getting some spattering while I was doing it, which is a, you know, it, I'm covering a pretty large area, so that's right. that could well be. Yeah, the other the other thing you might think about doing if if you want to do big areas like that. You know those those smaller water airbrushes that you have aren't really made for that. You know they're made for like oh, okay. in smaller areas. They do have air guns that you can go in and and blow in big backgrounds. Okay. So all right. Well, I'll, I'll look that up. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And Thank you. Yeah. I. You know it's it's when you when you really get into airbrushing. Ah. Uh, you know, there, there's really about, and we can talk about this later, there's about uh, six different types of airbrushes and, and they have different functions, you know. Um, so really, you know, you got to kind of figure out the type of work that you do and, and what, you, what you do more than anything else and, and then, you know, get, get I'm, set I'm up. I'm trying to figure that out now. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, and you just started, so yeah, you probably don't know quite, you know, uh, you know what you're going to end up doing with them. But uh, like the Iwatas that you have, they're great airbrushes, but they're really made for, you know, like close in, you know, work in small areas, you know, not so much a big general background. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, okay. Well, we got about twelve of us here, so. Uh, where I'm going to start sharing stuff here, this film, because it does run a little bit long. Um, anybody got anything they, they need to talk about before we go into this? Any questions? Just a question yeah? about the airbrushes. Is it airbrushes? Is it the yeah, same airbrush. as the airbrushes that you use for cake decoration? Yep. Yeah, same basic thing. Yeah, same tool. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Why? Do you decorate cakes? 
uh, used to, I love to do all this, you know, if you like painting, you like decorating cake too. <laughs> uh -huh. That's my yeah. enjoyment. But I have <laughs> right. not used airbrushes. I, I use it once in a while, but with my friends, but no mm -hmm. more. Yeah, I, uh, well, I did illustration for many years and probably uh, about 12 to 15 years of that. You know, I, I used an airbrush in my finished illustrations a lot, uh, you know, using acrylic paint. Uh, and it's you know, it's a great tool. You know, it's anyhow. Yeah, yeah anybody it's fun else? to use it for cake decoration. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. A lot of craft people use them. Uh, even even uh, potters and sculptors use them to put on like painted finishes, you know, on pieces and things. So yeah, they're they're really useful. Uh, anybody else got anything they want to? Okay. All right. So away we go. That's the desktop. Oh, okay. Here, hang on one second. Okay, because I got to get to the right place. There we go. All right. Uh, let's try that again. Are you? There we go. Found you. Yay. All right, hold on to your horses. I hope you have a cup of coffee. I don't know if you can even answer anymore. What is that side of it? Um, Basically, outsider art is. Uh, what is outsider art? Oh, you got me. <laughs> I've been trying to figure that out. Um, I certainly been called worse things in my life than an outsider artist. <laughs> is that somebody that is working outside? You know that. Uh, uh, doesn't mind if it rains or something and they'll draw outside. That's, that's what uh, I would have said, you know. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, I was a bit of an outsider artist. I was over on a bench over in Hyde Park, uh, laying low from the cops at night, uh, doing drawings <laughs> and such. No, what, what do you mean? Well, I mean, uh, do you feel like an outsider? Well, I suppose so, but I mean, but what does an outsider, what does an insider feel like? <laughs> uh, what are you saying, the name? Outsider art. Uh, outsider? <laughs> no, I don't know. Maybe it's a different planet represent for me. Outsider. But whatever you call it, when you see it, you know it. You know, you're looking for things that make you go, oh my God. And that's outsider art. Once upon a time, in the Italian countryside, not far from Venice, there lived a young boy named Carlo Zinelli. Carlo's mother died when he was very young, and he was taken out of school to go and work in the fields, tending to his father's cattle. When he grew into a young man, he joined the army and was sent off to fight in a terrible war. But he returned after just two months, and anyone who knew Carlo could tell that something was very wrong with him. He behaved strangely and refused to utter a single word. They tried to cure him with electricity, but that didn't work. And so he was sent away to an asylum with high walls and locks on the doors. And there he would stay, hidden from the world. 
One day, Carlo picked up a stone from the ground and began to draw on the walls. The nurses stopped him immediately, but Carlo couldn't stop. He wanted to draw everywhere, on anything. After a while, the doctors realized it kept him quiet, and so they gave him some broken old pencils and left him to it. Then one day, a Scottish artist called Michael Noble arrived. He was married to a rich Italian contessa and had come to the hospital to cure his fondness for whiskey. He saw what Carlo was doing with primitive equipment and was outraged. This man is an artist. You must let him create. And so, with the contessa's money, Michael Noble created a studio inside the asylum with good brushes and plenty of paint. Carlo Zanelli may have been unable to talk, but something else poured out of him. Carlo spent eight hours painting every day, completely engrossed in his work. By the time he died, he had made nearly 2,000 paintings. These works were once dismissed as the scrawlings of a lunatic. Now, Carlo Zanelli's work is on show, 70 miles from the asylum, at the biggest and most prestigious event in the art calendar. <laughs> It's early summer, and the Venice Biennale is just beginning. This festival is a barometer for the contemporary art world. It reflects current trends. And this year, so-called outsider artists like Carlo Zanelli are the hot topic. And Carlo became very prolific, and he started doing more and more work. His psychiatrist then took his art to see Jean de Buffet and André Breton. Carlo's work is here in Venice, thanks to this man the director of the Museum of Everything. The crosses there upside down must be the graves of the soldiers. And that star um, is the star of the Alpini soldiers, which he was conscripted. And you see that way. star everywhere in the line. I think there are all kinds of riddles hidden in there, but I, I think they're just for him. From what I know, he didn't care. The minute he finished one, he sort of threw it away. And the nurses and doctors would grab them up and quite a lot of them would make their way into their homes. But what happened to this work in the, in the interim? Generally speaking, Carlo's been curated by and for, let's say, the outsider art group audience. And that's why it stayed this sort of um, secret, I guess. Well, that secret is now well and truly out. The keynote exhibition here is the Encyclopedic Palace, where self-taught artists rub shoulders with big names from the contemporary art world. Have a look at these. They were made by a 38-year-old man with absolutely no artistic training. This man saw visions and heard voices. In private, he induced hallucinations and then recorded everything in small journals, a process he kept up for 16 years. That man was Carl Jung, Richard, one of I'm the founding you fathers of modern psychology. There's some background noise. Is there. he an outsider artist? I don't like to distinguish between insiders and outsiders, and that's what this exhibition is about. I've learned particularly from artists uh, that artists are curious about any uh, visual uh, manifestations, and so I wanted to make a show for artists and for the public in which the distinctions between the professional and the self-taught are blurred. What this Biennale does is disrupt the story of art as most of us know it. It brings us back to the most basic questions about the power and the purpose of art. Huh? What if there's this inborn urge to be an artist, inborn in these guys who had no chance? The thing that I think we look for in art is a kind of urgency, like the artist could not help to do it. 
and what we have in contemporary art right now is a lot of calculation where artists, the artists could there's no sense of that urgency or necessity it's fantastic to see here all these artists who were always marginalized until now and they're together with artists and this is where they belong obviously and by the way excuse me caravaggio was homeless incarcerated and insane and 90 percent of the <laughs> artists i've ever met are kind of a little insane so boom i i just have to say i've never seen a venice biennale as strong as this one i mean for me it's really I think this is a, a, a turn in history. I mean, it's a rupture. It's really very important. Some of the best work in Venice is by an outsider artist called Shinichi Sawada. The young man who made these strange and wonderful creatures works in almost total isolation at the top of a mountain in the backwoods of Japan. あの、ほとんど本人ですね。言葉がありませんのでね、こちらもその言葉であの相手を知ろうとしてもこれは当然無理だということで、お互いのその意気ですか、表情ですね。表情でお互いに感じ取ると。それしかないですね、今。はい。
Japanese society expects everyone to play a productive role, whatever condition they may have. Akane Kimura makes 0.8 of a yen, that's half a pence, for every sponge she puts in a plastic envelope. In the afternoon, she draws. And those pictures have been exhibited in museums across the world. その絵を描いた後に興味がなくなっているということは、描いている瞬間をすごく楽しんでいるということだと思うんですよ。書き上がった後それがこう人に認められているとか、それそれに価値がついたとかそういうこと自体には多分ご本人さん興味がないんじ
because the hospitals rarely archived it. The psychiatric world didn't fully appreciate the value of what their patients were making. But times have changed. Here in the forests north of Vienna lies the art group center, Guggen. Guggen is famous for its house of artists, home to 14 psychiatric patients who've been plucked from the Austrian system thanks to their artistic talent. Unlike the day centers of Japan, these artists live here full time. There is no obligation for them to make art, but still, it pours out of them. So you brought the outsiders inside. And how, how has the art world responded then to that? Uh, in the 80s, it was very difficult because on one hand, the world of psychiatry didn't understand it. And on the other hand, the, the art world saw this experiment. It was not really presented as art, you know? Uh, so what I wanted to show is that also single pieces of art of every good abrupt artist has the same worth as any other piece, single piece of any other kind of art. If you buy a Van Gogh, you have to pay 200 million dollars. Uh, and then the illness doesn't play any role. So it's the art that's important is what you're saying. Let's not focus on the, on the case studies, but how, how do you look after the artist then? One thing is the private life of an artist, and the other thing is his professional life as an artist. So on the one hand, we supported the artist in their private needs, you know, with illness or whatever, you know. And on the other side, we managed more or less their art. We organized exhibitions, we made publications, and uh, we selected their works because they themselves couldn't select so much. It's, it's the same work as any gallerist works with his artists, wherever. Perhaps the best known Guggen artist is the now deceased August Valla. It was almost as though his creative urges could not be contained within his room and exploded into the surrounding countryside, which he peppered with his work on any available surface. The Vatican has the Sistine Chapel, and Guggen has August Valla's old room. I came out just to Neuburg in the village Weitling. I mal schon seit zehn Jahren hier und es, meine Bilder sind schon, waren schon zweimal in Tokio in Japan, zweimal in New York, einmal, dreimal in 
Paris, come with me, I show you a picture. Look it, this is the card of the Danube, the Donau card. Eh? This is from Anfang, Anfang, uh, from Donau Quelle bis to Donau Mündung. Der, Hohe der höchste Berg von Deutschland ist die Zugspitze, ist 3000 Meter hoch fast. Dann ist da die Donau, fließt da runter so entlang, da ist noch die Rolon der Ines, 517 Kilometer. Das habe ich aus dem Gedächtnis, aus den, äh, alles aus meinen Gedanken habe ich das aus dem Gedächtnis. Ich bin ein super Jenny. <lacht> weißt du, wie viel äh, ich bekomme für so ein Bild? 6600 Euro. It's a lot of money. I see we have these images of the artists it's on the walls here. The fact that you're selling and exhibiting this work pretty successfully, what impact does that have on the artists? It depends on the artist. Johann Gaber is very aware of who he is. I know we went to Basel uh, to an exhibition in, in a gallery there and we had to fly with the airplane and then he asked me nina could you please carry my luggage and i say how comes yeah? and he said yeah i'm the artist <laughs> so, so in a way they're just like all these other famous artists they're all divas yes it? yes on one on one side of course yeah um so, and why not Ja, nehmen wir den Pinsel. We have place for 14 people, nothing more. That means I invite somebody if I see that he has a talent, but if he would, will become an artist is a question. You never know, you know. It needs time. Sometimes it's very easy. Sometimes it uh, needs 10 years. Sometimes it never will be. You're a very patient man. Uh, it's uh, life goes over 80 years. Uh, and not just for three months, you know? This is Gunter Schutzenhofer. He currently has a solo show at a gallery in New York. <laughs> I love his work because it doesn't look like anything that I know after doing this for 35 years.
Was ist das, Gunther? Richard, ich, uh, I'm gonna uh, mute you. Uh, 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 Radio. 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 This is a radio. Schusenhofer's work seems to have that uh, ability to transport diverse people in the same way that an inkblot test does. I've seen it over and over again. You look at something and say, well, well, what is this image? And one person's like, oh, it's a radio. Oh, it's a car. Oh, it's an airplane. It's a comb. It's a... And everyone is, is bringing their own brain to the work. Um, and that's a wonderful thing. Everyone is desperately trying to put outsider art into a nice, neat little box. And it doesn't really fit in because it's something that happened independently. It's something that owes nothing to art history. And when you, have some, when you, when you owe nothing to art history, you really have a problem. This work that was not made with that trapping of you know, will I, get, will I get into one of the good galleries? Will I be in the Biennale? I mean, it's very nice that it's there. It, should, it deserves a place in the Venice Biennale. But at the same time, I don't want to be so much part of that whole, oh, what's the market doing? Because then you're like financial stocks. You should love it because it, it inspires you to love. Not because people say, oh, this is safe now to love because it's, it's selling big. We can all get in on it. You know, like, what is that? I don't want that. Well, we had grand ambitions about 10 years ago that we were going to try to create a whole category at Christie's of outsider art. Unfortunately, there weren't enough investor speculator types who would be willing to um, fuel the market by reselling. That is, I think, one of the problems we had with creating uh, an auction category. Many of the passionate outsider art collectors are in some ways as obsessive as the artists they collect and uh, they love the works they have and they keep them. Aren't they beautiful? Yes, they are great. I've, I've been collecting this group of cars probably for about 30 years whenever I could, either they came up in auction or from private collections or wherever. Madge Girl was controlled by a spirit guide who she named as Minor Rest. Minor Rest. Yeah, but in my inner rest. I would think that these are a repeated self-portrait over and over again. There's an obsessive quality to many of these artists. But often, like the British outsider Madge Gill, they work in isolation. Where professional artists forge their creations in a dialogue with art history, the outsider is engaged in a monologue. One of the exciting things about seeing an outsider artist you've never seen before is that you've never seen anything like it before either. Because each outside artist is like an art movement of one. And they invent their own techniques, their own disciplines, their own ways of working, and their own visions. And that's why they come up with something completely individual each time. Now this is a little picture by Joe Coleman. It's a self-portrait of Joe just after he'd carried out his autopsy on a dead body in a Hungarian hospital. And that's, that's him there. It's called The Pathologist. I couldn't afford his paintings. They're so expensive. They're big paintings are about this big. So I said, oh, Joe, can you just do me a little tiny painting that I could just about afford? And so that's what done. Our little grandson really frightened him. Welcome to the auditorium.
I got kicked out of art school and then they asked me to be an advisor many years later after I had a certain following at that point. <laughs> and so I said, okay, I, I'll be an advisor. So immediately I told the kid, get, get the fuck out of school because you're not going to learn a goddamn thing in that school. You have to go out there and live, you know, and that's where you're going to find your art, not in art school. At home, it was really pretty fucked up because, you know, my father was a pretty violent alcoholic and he tormented my, my mother and the rest of the family. And I found release and, and uh, relief in, in drawing. When I started painting, my brush strokes were bigger. And now, now I barely even move my brush. And it's a one hair brush and I use jewelers lenses. I'm looking for more and more information on the surface of the painting. Even though it's coming out of somewhere, I mean, out there or in here, but it's appearing here and that's where I'm finding it. And the more minute that I look, the more that I find. I try to take care of the misfits, you know, and uh, the losers. The losers never get to write their side of history, except in my work. Joe Kilman's customers include Johnny Depp and Leonardo DiCaprio. Prices for his paintings have risen steadily, and there's now a waiting list. People want the work quicker than his one-hair brush can paint it. In fact, such is his popularity, but in a peculiar twist, he's now banned from showing at the Outsider Art Fair on account of being too successful. What does this tell us? Perhaps it suggests we fetishize these artists. We prefer them to be poor and struggling. Across town lives one such artist who fits that bill. Hi, welcome to New York. Come in. Come in here. Yeah, now you can do. It's okay. When Ionel Talpazan was still a boy in Romania, he had an encounter with what he believes was a UFO, which bathed him in a strange blue light. His life's work is an attempt to make sense of this. And this is uh, my spaceship UFOs. I work many sites. I make this soy because the color, because this blue, color blue, for me represents that energy the inspiration me to create this uh, drawing, art, and everything. Second spaceship we have for large. That is still not finished in project. Because I'm probably financial problem, I can finish. Wait. Maybe you like it. All my art I do, uh, uh, I, I do experiment. Look at the a lot of, lot of material. I broke a lot of things, a lot of canvas. The artist is like an astronaut. With the mind, you can travel entire universe. Lionel's parents sold him for just under a hundred pounds when he was a baby. As a young man, he took drastic measures to escape the Ceausescu regime and swam the Danube from Romania to Yugoslavia, eventually finding refuge in the United States. He's lived in this one-room apartment in Harlem for 18 years. It was at the Outsider Art Fair. I had a booth there, I used to show, show the outsiders work there, but Arnold used to be outside in the snow every day selling his artwork on the street. So in a way, Arnold shot himself in the foot because he's, he was always outside selling his work for a fraction of the cost that I would like to have sold it for on my booth at the fair. 
Uh, I sell pens for nice sometimes. Uh, Starry actually for ten dollars. The size. Sometimes couple hundred dollars, a bit couple hundred dollars. Sometimes. But it's not happening every day. I like to sell direct, no consignments, no contract, low. I need money. I need to buy. Uh, this is the original in colors, the way I look at my special phone. Actually, in this position. I have uh, some uh, idea about vacuum. Somewhere like that. Take the vacuum, the vacuum transformation and energy and field system, field magnetic, anti magnetic uh, dimension. I know I have only one idea. I have six. You don't need it to make bomb atomic to destroy this planet. You need to use this source of energy to travel the universe forever. But it's different time, different space, therefore, different work. See? I do different. My art is unique art. Unique mind, unique art on planet Earth. I know may be plowing a lonely furrow, but then again, they all laughed at Christopher Columbus when he said the world was round. They all laughed when Edison recorded sound. The alternative guide to the universe is brimming with mavericks. Self-taught artists, unlicensed architects, fringe physicists, and visionary inventors. Hayward Gallery director Ralph Rugoff treated me to a private tour as it was hung. Something about his movement is quite scary, isn't it? Wu Yu Lu is a farmer in China who's taught himself how to make robots using, again, whatever materials at hand. And he's made robots who commit suicide, robots who smoke cigarettes, robots who do the dishes for him. And uh, this is a child robot. When you think about the idea of a child robot in China, given China's policy of only one child per yeah. family, who's going to be a sibling for all those yeah. single children? This is a remarkable French artist named Marcel Storr. These are all made in the 1970s. He was an uh, orphan, he was deaf. He worked as a street sweeper in the Bois de Boulogne and he would go home at night and make these incredibly intricate drawings. And these were cityscapes he called megalopolises and this was his blueprint for the rebuilding of Paris, which he was convinced was gonna be destroyed in a nuclear attack. This was one of his last unfinished works. Uh -huh. I mean, I mean, it gives you a sense of how he worked, which is great. Incredibly detailed, painstaking, elaborate lines that he's drawing, where they're so small, I can't even see them with, the, with my eye anymore, you know? Yeah. It's this idea also in this art, if you can't live in the real world, you know, or you're not happy there, then create an alternative reality for yourself. And that's what he seems to have done. Paul well, Laffley is an inventor of all kinds of devices. He was one of the assistant architects helping on the original World Trade Center in New York. And at a certain point, he went off in a different direction. It's good to be unknown for a long time because then you can actually, you know, pump up what you're doing and make it in, into a format where they, they can't destroy it. Because if you're in an art school, though, that's the worst place to go. That's the one thing I said to myself, never enter an art school. But I did go to an architectural school, but get, got kicked out after one year for conceptual deviance. <laughs> Paul, come up with plans for a time machine where your body doesn't travel through time. You're just able to see what different times look like. Mentally, you can project yourself. Yeah, I mean, but Stephen Hawking said we'll see a, a time machine in the next 50 years. Laughley says he had an encounter with an alien intelligence that changed his life. 
and that directed him to make this painting. And that if you put your hands, this is the left hand of the past, the right hand of the future. If you put your hands, Alan, on those two things and put your head forward, you're supposed to be able to download intelligence from another dimension. You look different. I'll let you know. <laughs> so this is a sort of injection of something, also you could see it in Venice as well, uh, a, a different way of looking at the world, a sort of mutation of art and science and mathematics and mysticism. I think a lot of this work in this show harkens back to a kind of Renaissance moment when science and art weren't so different. If you think about Leonardo and Michelangelo, and they were, they were making weaponry, they were thinking yeah. about flight, they were thinking, you know, about science as well as thinking about art. They were all engaged in the pursuit of knowledge and in understanding what it meant to be human, which is something contemporary artists lost sight of. You know, supposedly now we have experts who look after that for all of us. All these people in this show are people who decided they don't want the experts to look after it, they've got their own ideas about how this works. George Widener is the kind of person who will see a license plate and will make him think of a date. It'll be Thursday. He'll then think of every event he's ever read or heard of that happened on a Thursday with that number date. And he's made landscapes, whole cities, based on these ideas of time. George believes in this idea called the singularity is that in the near future, machines will become intelligent, will have artificial intelligence. And a lot of people put this date at 2045, which now is starting to seem not that far away. started to listen to this voice inside of me and stuff that was interested in these patterns and it became, started to become very strong. You know, I was institutionalized uh, at one point, you know, because uh, it was uh, going over these things in my head over and over and over and over and over again. There's a thing called uh, a magic square. These numbers, if you add them up this way, they add up to 34. If you add them up this way, they add up to 34, right? In all directions, they add up to an identical sum of 34. And in, in the case of this sculpture, all these, this 2, 17, 29, 11, 10, 5, and 13 add up to 70, and I create symmetrical patterns using the days of the week. And there's this linkage between the present, the past, and the future. What happened in the past was I was, you know, trying to do too much in my life. I kind of got overwhelmed and went from being an engineering scholar to being uh, on the streets and stuff. Now I'm in galleries. I associate with dealers, art dealers. I show at art fairs, I sell my work, you know, so what to make of it? I don't know, you know, I don't think about it too much. You know? <laughs> if you were to look at the Fridays of 1912, it's January 5, 12, 1926, February 2, 9, 16, 23, March 1, 8, 15, 22, 29, April 5, 12, 19, 26, May 3, 10, 17, 24, 31, so on, you know, so I, I, I see them in my head, they line up and stuff, and I feel um, that there will be huge technological changes in the future. Machines will be able to scan these very rapidly and see these interconnections and find this sort of interesting. They're going to need artwork too, the robots and machines of the future, so I'm simply making 
some work uh, for them and stuff to relax with and stuff. I'm just being useful, I think. That's what I'm doing, you know. The Museum of Everything started life in a former dairy in 2009. It has an exceptional collection of outsider art, and just as revolutionary as the work is the way it's presented. With no fixed abode, it takes over spaces for a limited time only. The ramshackle, hand-knitted aesthetic is the work of Eve Stewart, the award-winning production designer of Les Mis and The King's Speech. It's playful and unpretentious, a million miles from the intimidating white space of most contemporary galleries. Here it is again, popping up in London, in Selfridges. Who else would think to stage an art exhibition slap bang in the middle of Oxford Street? This man pops up everywhere too. The museum's freewheeling director, James Brett. Now he is the ringmaster of a traveling circus as it hurtles across Russia, sniffing out secret works by unknown artists. This convoy has collected new work in four different Russian cities. And now it has come to a stop in Moscow for a huge show of that work at Dasha Zukova's garage. This very graphic work is by Oleg Gordev, who's a, a street cleaner and a handyman, and he's a self-taught historian. And when you talk to him, actually, he was a really troublesome kid, and I think narrowly escaped being in prison. And he's a sweet character. But obviously, as you can see in this room, there's a lot of Nazis. It's one thing to have one Hitler in your show. We've got two Hitlers. And that Hitler is what sort of sold me on him, because it's, it's, it's Hitler and he's just realized he's lost the war. And if you look at his features, you can see the pain. <laughs> this one, which is again, you know, same period, it's a Russian soldier seductively licking the cheek of a um, female Nazi officer. And there, there's something about the humor of the whole thing, but actually he's thrilled by these episodes of war. And I, I, somehow nobody else was doing it like that. Um, I certainly hope he's not a fascist, I can't really tell. I have a really complicated relationship with this artist. The first time I saw her work, I was very confident, not for us, thanks very much, because it's too, it's too simple in its depiction of the world. But this woman is far from simple. And once I started looking at what, what she does, you happen to be pointing the camera at the ones that changed my mind. The artist, Pajova, she's about 80 years old. She's not skinny. And she lives in this apartment block and is very proud of what I think is 150 or so lovers that she's had during her lifetime. She's a very erotic woman. You know, you haven't just got animals doing it with their own species you've got animals doing it with other species and then things get worse this is not a one-off or a two-off there are hundreds of these pictures it's not that these are masterpieces but still i'm in love with this picture i mean the two brontosauruses making out by the river it's just phenomenal and, and it probably happened <laughs>
this artist you've got to look at. I mean, you take a big look. This is a 15 year project of one man who goes every day to the park in Nishki Novgorod and paints the same or virtually the same landscape. And what he's documenting from the top of this to the bottom is the weather. My only sadness is we were only able to get a year off Victor. I was hoping for five years. The whole of this museum in Moscow couldn't contain all 15 years. It took us six months to persuade him to allow us to show it here. Partially because he said, well, look, someone's going to call up and they're going to need to know what was the weather March 2010. I said, no one's going to call you up. This is a great opportunity to communicate your life's work. There were very few contemporary artists who would spend 15 years on one project. He didn't even make it to the opening of the exhibition because he was afraid that he would miss a day of doing this. It's because статус э, самодеятельного художника повышается, что это не двоюродные братья. Э, я не вписана в, как бы, в контемпорарный процесс. А, с другой стороны, что значит аутсайд? Может быть, все мы, кого называют аутсайдерами, на самом деле самый-самый, э, не, не в самом конце, а в самом начале. I love the word outsider at the beginning because, of course, I felt it associated with me and I, I, I can be weird. And I like that weirdness. I like my differences. But the more I looked into it, the more I thought this just can't be correct. I realized that the mainstream museums were using it to segregate. The other big thing for me is not to present it as the work of a bunch of crazy people. I mean, if I'm really frank, that's often the assumption. And so the other key issue is to say, look, Who's crazy? Who's disabled? Who's able? Why do we think that if someone has a mental health issue, it's just a cut and dry thing? Everybody has a mental health issue. It's a question of degree. And once you start to understand that, I think you take a step back into creativity and our reasons for making. Why do we create? Picasso said that every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain one once we grow up. Welcome to Critical Dark Center. Critical Dark Center is a good place. Yeah, let's go do it. San Francisco has always been a crucible for radical ideas. So it's no surprise that it's home to creative growth. Every day, more than 100 people that society calls disabled come here to make art. was by the founders originally, Elias Katz and his wife Florence, that there's an innate creative impulse in all humans. And given encouragement and materials, that will come out. Dan Miller was the first creative growth artist to have his work bought by New York's Museum of Modern Art. Right. For me, when I watch Dan work, you see a kind of anxiety and frustration, almost as if everything he needs to say is in his head and he's just really struggling with getting it out. Um, for most of us who are speech enabled, we were talking out and Dan doesn't seem to be able to, so he needs to draw it out and really hope that someone will understand, will get the translation, that will get the urgency of his message. Go pick up the ball cap. Right. Right, Jenny?
I love the atmosphere of this place. You can walk in off the street, just talk to the artist, buy a piece of work, or a limited edition comic book, or even a, a t-shirt. Now brown is the color of chocolate, which we all know and love. Taste that chocolate, and you cannot tell if it's made from Hershey, Cardelli, or Dove. For in that tasty chocolate delight, there is no black, there is no white. Oh, DJ Disco, that, that's me. The all-star chocolate heroes. You've created a whole new universe here. Oh, yes. Where did the all-star chocolate heroes come from? Well, it all just came from my hand when I when I decided to have some superheroes of my own. And the comic book right here is going to help me start my own business in entertainment. And a lot of people, whether they're my family or friends, are really prou proud of me of working real hard on this one. Time to get busy up in here. Um, this is their crib. Their crib is where they live, I take it. Yeah, yeah. Green knows she's the type of arch enemy who hates he hates everything to do with chocolate. He he doesn't even like to like to drink hot chocolate because he he, he thinks that chocolate is no fun. But that's not really true. Chocolate can be fun. Now that you've captured Green Nose, let's head down to Mel's for a chocolate shake. Yes. So it all ends. That was their reward for capturing. Oh, here Green they are Nose. having their chocolate shake. I dedicate this one to all the ladies who have pretty feet and for. And for men and guys who appreciate women's pretty feet, they can uh, express how they feel like, like I have. They can say nice things of, about a woman's pretty feet in a sweet, positive, symbolized manner like I have. You can't quite see their feet, though. But... Well, I, I can. I have good vision. And here's where their feet are at. Right now, I'm dealing with hair loss, but I'll have a plan to get my hair back. You've got a plan, eh? Mm -hmm. Let me know about it. Oh, yes. <laughs> Once upon a time, in a rough part of San Francisco, there lived a boy called William. He was different to the other kids. And they would tease him at school. He would walk home and try to ignore the drunk men shouting in the street. Sometimes he heard gunshots outside his window. He wished they would go away. Then one day he came here and began to draw. He drew the people who had been shot back to life. He drew his city, but the way he wanted it to be. And he drew beautiful and strong women he'd never met. Yeah, what I do right here? So I do right here, last long language, is a queen Sheba. See, yeah. she's a peacemaker, low language, the peacemaker, and she has beautiful yeah. eyes. Hey, I just got back from another world. It was a way, way past another side. It was across the mountain and through the sea, past the moon, beyond all things that we've dreamed about. You never in your life seen such colors. That glows like a twinkle in an eye. The Museum of Modern Art in New York now has four of William Scott's paintings. He's also fond of making Halloween masks. And yes, that was him in Selfridge's window. William's been doing a series of paintings very recently um, about reinventing his life in the 70s. So William paints himself as either a successful basketball player or popular at the prom 
or with a happy, healthy family. And what he's doing is he's going back to those transformative years to make them better, to make his life today better, to make the disability go away, to make an injury to his body that he had then disappear. This is a me right here, that's me. I was on, on the beach at Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk in another life of 1974, another life. Yeah, I'm gonna be like that. Uh, in, and wearing an afro, I'm be like that. I wanna be like that, wearing an afro with my, with my new body, with my new body, uh, a, a, perf, a perfect body. That's Michael Jackson. So you're on the front cover yeah. of Modern Painters with it. Yes, right. It's a great picture. That's Christina. The invention, yeah. Dear Christina Hernandez, I have been single for a long time. I am tired being, it bothers me too much. I wanted a wife real bad. I've never had any kids. I wanted to become a father for good. Christina, I wanted you to be putting me into friendship and social skills. Yeah. Have you developed your friendship and social skills? Uh, You're pretty lovable, William, yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh -huh. There's something very moving and powerful about this place. It feels like an environment where anything is possible. And there's room for wit, for charm, and for mystery and magic. Thank you, honey. Bye. Art is about looking at the world in different ways. It lets us see things through the eyes of its maker. And in doing so, it refreshes our own view of the world. It's a tonic for the imagination. Every one of these artists has created and inhabits their own world with such conviction that it becomes recognizable to us. And the best part of all is that we are invited to step inside. Welcome to my world Won't you come on in Miracles I guess Still happen now and then Step into my heart Leave your cares behind Welcome to my world With you in mind, waiting just for you. Welcome to my world. Okay, that's it. That's it, Jack. It's a wrap. What are we doing? Wow, oh, wow. I can't wait to see this on YouTube. Can't wait to see it. Well, I can see it at my leisure. Oh, okay. I tell you. Welcome to my world. Welcome to yeah, my world. That was really good. Welcome to my world. <laughs> So you guys enjoy Tom, it? can you give us a link of that video again? I really like to watch it one more time by myself. Sure. Do you yeah. have the link? 
Yeah, I'll I'll send it out. Uh, you know. Yeah, please email. do. Please do. Okay. Yeah. Thank it, you. Yeah, that was a. It was. It was a. <laughs> yeah, it was a. It was a great piece, just because you know it introduced you to this whole idea of outsider art, and to the question of, you know, um, you know, really, what is, you know, outsider art, and is it really outside, and and why? Why why would it be considered outside? Just because these people are not trained, or they you know, you can view them as having a disability or being a little different than, you know, what we consider to be, you know, quote unquote, normal, <laughs> you know, and, you know, we've talked about that in this group, you know, I mean, as, you know, when we, when we look at, you know, uh, you know, the people, you know, that attend this class, you know, it's like, how many of us are really normal and, and what is normal? <laughs> Yeah, we're all not me. <laughs> yeah, and it's okay. You know, it's it's yeah, it's 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 kind of like that's the whole thing about you know making art is it gives you a chance to kind of express who you are. So anyway, I wanted to share that with you. Anybody any uh, comments, questions, anything like yeah. that? What was the? How would I get that on YouTube? What was the name of it? Uh, well, here the title. Yeah. Gonna send a link. Let's see. Click. Yeah, I was going to send out a link. It's uh, turning the art world inside out. Oh. Okay. That was the name of it. Uh, yeah, I saw, I saw that. And, uh, you know, I was like, okay. You know, I, I, I could do a, a painting video or something like that, but I figured, no, nah, this is a little different. This will get you guys thinking. And, you know, mainly for me, um, you know, I want you to kind of go away from this and think about, okay, uh, some, some of you still kind of have this thing about, you know, well, I'm not really an artist, you know, and the fact is, really? <laughs> You know, <laughs> I, say, I say that because what's in my head I can't put on paper. So how come I can see it but I can't put it down? You know. Well, but you you do. You know now, and that's that's a whole nother discussion. You know that's a that's a struggle with technique, and with familiarity of materials and things like that, and that just comes from doing and experimenting and working with materials. So, you know, uh, over time, and we've talked about this, you know, many times, you know, draw more, you know, paint more, you know, the more you do it, you know, you're not going to get worse, you're only going to get better. So, and, you know, the hardest thing for an artist is, is not really the technical part of it. It's the, uh, you know, it's more the concepts, the ideas, you know, and what do you want to say? Uh, and that always seems to be the biggest struggle for folks. So, anybody else? Real quick. Beauty is beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Yes, it is. And, I mean that that definitely proves that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Agree. It is. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, I hate to cut this off, but uh, yeah, we've been here a little bit, and uh, I'll be back at uh, two o'clock. And some of you guys have sent some stuff in. If you want to get stuff in, send it to me via email. And, uh, you know, we'll take a look at it this afternoon, okay? Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. You guys take care.